for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And he's talking about breaking the bread. Let's keep the feast, the breaking of bread, the worship service. Let's keep it together as individuals, but we have to be pure. There's no supposed to be no leaven here when we participate in this, right? You're supposed to deal with sin in your life first before you come, right? Examine yourself. Verse 9, I wrote to you in a letter not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then you must needs go to the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or railer, or drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are outside? Do not you judge them that are within? For them that are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. I'm going to preach on this in a couple of weeks. The point here is simply this. There is a list of sins that are so public, so damaging to the collective testimony of a group of Christians in any community, that anybody that belongs to the Christian community in that place that is doing that either should repent or be removed. Right? Now Catholics call it excommunication. Other groups call it shunning. There are different words for it. And those groups don't necessarily always practice it biblically. Right? There are right methodologies. But the simple fact is, is that there is a black, line, black and white line here between what is acceptable and not acceptable. Obviously, it is acceptable to have fellowship with one another as long as we're walking with the Lord, right? As long as you're walking in the light, we can get along good, no problem. But when you step out of the light, that kind of ruins it, doesn't it? How do I know when you come to church? How do you know? Let me turn it around. How do you know when I stand up in church to make, to preach, that I'm in fellowship with God? You should be praying for me. That I am. That I would be convicted if I am. That I am not. I mean, there have been cases where I had a fight with my wife on Saturday night or Sunday morning, and I, we weren't on talking terms, and I had to preach at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock, right? And I was so miserable that I, before the time came, I had to go see my wife. I had to get it dealt with, or at least I had to pray to the Lord and promise I was going to see her when I had the time to do it. I mean, it came down to the wire just like that on some, some cases. Right? <laughs> you got to get out of the darkness, get back in the light, because if you're not in the light, how can God bless your ministry? It's hypocritical. Right? And so, as believers, God knows none of us are perfect. Right? And excommunication isn't required for, you know, for husbands that have a fight with their wife, or wives that have a fight with their husbands, or somebody that watches a bad program on TV that they shouldn't watch or something, right? The Bible doesn't tell us that, you, you know, you chop the line, cut it right out. You know, you hear, it's not like that. It's not like that. There are some sins that are so damaging, yes. Yes, right? But in the meantime, this is where the long-suffering, this is where the patient, this is where the restoration, this is where the admonition on a personal level comes from. This is where the neighborhood watch mentality enters into the picture. And so we as believers fellowship as long as we're walking in the light. God knows there's no perfect members. Right? So now what, do, what does this boil down to? Well, another prerequisite for church membership then, I believe, based on passages like the one we just read, is that Number seven, a believer who desires to enter into fellowship in a group, in a church, must not be under legitimate discipline from another church. Must not be under legitimate discipline from another church. So when Rick and Lucille came here from the Baptist Church, I called Pastor Norton at the time, and I called him and I said, are these people under discipline from Mountain View Baptist Church? No. Oh, okay. Was there a problem? Uh, no. Okay, fine. Right? And so that's this, the policy that's not usually explained, but that's the way it works. Right? We made a mi <laughs> yeah. I made a mistake uh, two Sundays ago. I blew it. 
because my job as pastor, one of my jobs is to be an overseer, right, and to protect, to help protect the body, okay? There's Steve Wood, for example, is under church discipline from Mountain View Baptist Church. I believe the discipline is legitimate. He came here several years ago asking to join our church uh, or to fellowship with us, and I said the same thing. Are you under discipline? He said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Oh, okay, well, let me get back to you. So I went and I visited them. I had to understand enough about the situation to figure out whether it was legitimate or not. I concluded that they were right, he was wrong, and there's been no effort on his part to resolve that outstanding conflict. He's never repented of his sin. He considers them wrong still. Unless something's changed. <laughs> you know, but anyway, so he, he, he showed up there two weeks ago on Sunday morning wanting to go into that church and fellowship with those believers. They met him at the door and said, has anything changed? No. I'm sorry, you can't come in here. Now, I didn't know that, but he showed up here, okay? And I'm not, you know me, I'm kind of a timid kind of a guy. I'm not your in-your-face kind of a guy. And I don't equate coming and sitting in a church meeting with church fellowship. I just don't equate it, right? And, you know, when a person comes in here, they will sit under the sound of the Word of God. I will preach the Word. Somebody else better preach the Word of God. And if they are open to the preaching of the Word of God, then there is hope for them to have their heads reconfigured if they're living in sin or in rebellion to bring them to repentance. That's good. Come in the doors and sit and listen. The right? problem is that some people I know, you know won't be satisfied with coming in here. They will talk to everybody around them and try to be a continuing influence in other people's lives, and they're under discipline, and they ought not to be allowed to happen, and I allowed it to happen. I shouldn't have allowed it to happen. And, uh, and so this applies to our lives as one another as believers. You know, if you want to be a member in good standing, in fellowship, you want to fellowship with the believers in this church, then walk in the light. Walk in the light, right? Private sin requires private confession. Public sin requires public confession or discipline if there's no confession, right? Those are the policies that prevail from the scriptures. Uh, another case in point, I need to say this because it illustrates the principles that we're talking about. Um, there's a gal that's been coming to church on and off here in the last month, and, uh, you know, she is under church discipline from Hayden. Right? And I don't agree with all the stuff that happens at Hayden Bible Chapel, but I guarantee you that in this case it's right. The discipline is correct because she is guilty of sin, and it's a serious sin. She's unrepentant, and Christians need to join those Christians in speaking to her about her sin and confronting her with her sin and not encouraging her in her rebellion. Now, I, did, I have talked with her personally and encouraged her to do the right thing, to confess her sin. And told her that believers here would embrace her if she would. So far she has not. So she came in and sat here under the sound of the preaching of the word. To my knowledge, she hasn't been that much of an influence, although I'm afraid maybe she has. I don't know. But it's dangerous when a person is under discipline for Christians just to pretend everything's okay. Come on in and have fellowship with me. No. No, no. It's first line of defense is you. Admonish one another. Speak the truth in love. Right? And if we hold that standard up as one another, then we protect ourselves as believers from infection from outside, from bad influence. Right? And so, when, how does this come to prerequisites for church discipline? It means that when anybody would like to be a member in a local body, the whole question of their lifestyle and whether or not they have dealt with their sins, if they are guilty of sins, is a, is a live issue. It's a live issue. It's a key ingredient in the, in the equation. When you come here, are you under discipline? Yes or no? Right? So from Acts chapter 2, from that record, um, we have the essentials of church discipline. I'm not church discipline, excuse me. We have the essentials of church fellowship. So when a person wants to be a member of a church, are you saved? 
Is there evidence that you're saved? Are you willing to be baptized? Are you willing to bow to the teaching of the apostles? Are you willing to learn? Are you willing to be loyal to the assembly? Are you willing to submit to the biblical standard of personal lifestyle? Are you willing to deal with sin in your life? Work at it? Not ignore it. Not overlook it. But work at it. Don't excuse it. Right? Submit to the biblical standards of the way we ought to live in the light. Now, if you're willing to submit to those things and to become loyal to the assembly and, and make this your family, right? not that we... This, this is not a cult. We don't cut you off from all your other relationships and discourage those things whatsoever. That's cultic. That's mind control. Right? We don't do that at all. But we insist that if you're going to be a member, that you treat us as your family and that you involve yourself in our lives. And there are lots and lots of people that are in a confusing situation here at Northland. You know, um, we have... We have uh, people who have been here so long that, you know, it's assumed that they're members, right? And they come to every Sunday meeting, the Sunday morning meeting when the church doors are open, but they don't come to any of the other meetings of the church. There's, they don't join for prayer. Uh, they don't join for worship. Um, when there are special meetings for the edification and building up and instruction of the saints, they're not there, Right? They, uh, there may be some personal fellowship with some friendships that they have in the church. There may be a little bit of giving, right? Now, is that person a member of the church? It's a difficult question. All I can say is that membership in the body of Christ is a constant thing. It's all or nothing here, right? You either are or you aren't. On a practical level, level, we have people that are sometimes, are a little bit, are occasionally, <laughs> and in some cases are a whole hog there all the time. They are truly members. So this forces people in leadership decisions to ask questions like, well, is this person an attender? Is this person um, a casual attender? Is this person truly a member in good standing and in fellowship with God and with the saints? Uh, is this person um, uh, an inactive member? Is this person, um, <laughs> you know, in an undefined category in relationship to us here? You see, this raises all of those questions. And I want to raise those questions for you today because there are real advantages of being a member of the local church. If you are in membership, in full membership, uh, you are actively serving God and in fellowship with God and men, then there are no restrictions. You are gifted by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads you, and you have full freedom to minister, to preach, to teach, it, we're exhort, to exhort, to, uh, to participate in all the life of the church, to be, if you qualify to the biblical standards of leadership uh, at the elder level or at deacons or being a missionary or all those things, if you are a member, then it's, the doors are wide open for your involvement in the assembly. But if you are in an undefined relationship to the assembly, it's inconsistent for us to partially apply the rule sometime and not at other times. So if we're going to do something for God, we need people to commit, to be loyal. We need to know who's in and who's out. We want people to go from inactive membership status, if you consider yourself a member, but not participating, to become fully participating in the life of the body. Commit. Give it everything you got. I do. Why shouldn't you? And you know something? It can only be better when you know who's in and when you know who's out. Right? And if we practice these biblical standards of relating to one another, right? You are a member of the body of Christ if you're a believer. If you want to be a member of this local body, give evidence of salvation. You know? Be willing to be baptized if you haven't. Um, submit to the standards of Christian lifestyle that we feel are biblical here. Right? Become loyal and involved in this assembly. Be there bodily. Show up. Give. Pray. Worship. Do all the stuff that all the other brothers and sisters are doing. Now we try not to make it legalistic. If you miss four Sundays, 
You can even go hunting in October if you want. You can miss a couple of Sundays. <laughs> Nobody will ever say anything against you. You can take holidays. Nobody will ever keep track in a book of how many Sundays this person left. And if they miss six Sundays in a row, then they're in the inactive status right off. <laughs> you understand? Like, it's not like that. There's grace, long-suffering. But, you know, there has to be a line somewhere. There has to be a line. And you have responsibilities if you're a member. If you say you're going to be a member, then you should be continually steadfasting in all of those things. And if you are not, then that pulls into question, calls into question your status, your allegiance, your commitment, your what you value in your relationship with believers in this world. And it raises confusion in the minds of those who are committed. <laughs> well, I don't know if we can commit, count on this person or not. I just really don't know what they think about this. It puts a burden on those around you. So let me call on you, all of you, if you do not think, or sure, if you're not sure you're a member, you know, we're going to make this available for people. If this is simplified form here, right? And, uh, you know, we'll make copies of this available. Read it over, pray about it, study these scriptures out, familiarize yourself with it. Don't just take my word for it. Okay, look into the word and read it. And then what we really need here is more people to cross the line from just attending to being full-fledged members with a real genuine commitment to the life of the body of Jesus Christ as exhibited in this particular place. That's what we need. We need to be able to count on people, a team, that with one voice, with one mind, with one heart, will pray, worship, evangelize, work together, minister to one another's needs. And when we have a team, then there's no end to the potential that exists for tremendous outreach and ministry in this community. Right? But you've got to get off your ducks. you gotta, you got to see the issues for what they are. Right? And you have to become involved in the life of the body. Now, if I've offended you, uh, and I'm wrong, I will confess it. I will apologize. Right? If, if I've challenged you to think about your walk with God and your need to get busy and move on, uh, so be it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not your judge. I am your brother, and I am a leader, and I am calling you to think about your, your relationship with me and with others in this place that have a real desire to serve the Lord. And uh, we want you. We don't want to drive anybody away. We really, really, really want you. Right? But we want you to understand what it involves. We need real commitment here. Real commitment. Right? It's not halfway. Okay? So, pray about it. And uh, I also uh, came across this. Uh, have you taken a personal spiritual inventory? This doesn't have anything directly to do with church membership, but it will be something that will incite you to be thinking about where you stand in your relationship with God and your brothers uh, and sisters in the faith. And uh, if you want copies of these, let me know and I'll make copies for you. Okay? Be happy to talk with anybody on a personal basis um, about these things. And, uh, you know, talk to the people up at the Baptist Church. they got important things to say. You know, it hurt my feelings if you go talk to your pastor up there. Ask them, what would I have to do if I want to be a member in this church? It'd probably be good, a, a good Bible study. Could turn into a good Bible study. Right? Yeah, it would. So, um, you know, we are a family. We are a body. Sometimes we just don't act like it. Right? And it's time to grow up. It's time to learn trying to commit to what we know. Right? And um, we'll all quit talking. <laughs> we bow before you, Heavenly Father, and we, uh, we love you for your love to us, and we thank you that you are a loving Father, and you care for us as brothers and sisters, at, rather as your children. You have exhibited your great love for us. You birthed us into your, this spiritual family, and then you have called us as brothers and sisters in this family, to uh, minister to one another, to help one another, to encourage and strengthen one another, to admonish, if necessary, to discipline. We know you are watching. We know the angels are watching. We know the lost are watching. My prayer is that the lost people in Guru River would 
in a, in a few weeks or months time see a, a more vibrant and powerful and spiritually appealing group of believers working together in this place that we would have an impact in this community like we've never had before we pray this in Jesus name amen